Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. Welcome back to part two of two of our interview of JC, otherwise known as Ninja, our EF-111A Raven. Uh, well, I said technician, that's not correct. What, what's the correct name for your specialization? Well, it's uh, flight controls and instrumentation specialist. Roger, and the reason I don't put that is because it's just too big on YouTube. So I just say technician or engineer, it's just the best I can get. Within. Yeah, te technician. technician's probably the, the, the easiest thing for people to get. Roger. And part one, we took an hour and a half and we only managed to answer 18 questions. Now, the problem is this aircraft is just so cool that we just talked for ages and ages. I knew it was going to happen and it happened. Uh, however, we've got lots of questions from the public that want to be answered. So this time we're just going to go straight in, no chit chat and uh, just get it done. OK, so if you want to go see part one of two, uh, I will link it in the video description and you can go and watch it. Uh, OK, right. So question 19 regards the EF-111A Raven. Was the US USAF the only one to operate the Ravens or any other air forces as well? No, it was just the Air Force. Um, the, the thing was so expensive that most uh, that most places couldn't have couldn't afford to keep it. Why was it so expensive? I mean, even, even if Australia wanted to. Oh, it's just the ALQ-99. Mm -hmm. That's the most expensive part, plus just tried to keep it in in the air. Mm -hmm. um, if they would have moved it to... If they would have started modifying F models, that would have been prohibitively expensive as well. Mm -hmm. Roger. Makes sense. Okay, fine. Uh, where were you deployed in Italy, and did you have a good time over there, or was it just work, work, work? I thought we'd answer this, but maybe it must be my imagination. Yeah, we actually did answer that in the previous one, but oh, uh, yeah, okay. I, I was in Aviano, and I enjoyed it immensely, and I enjoyed working with uh, all the other uh, NATO uh, air forces uh, that were there with us. But usually, we would work 12-hour shifts, and if it got bad, we would go up to 16 sometimes. But it wouldn't be too out of the ordinary to just do 12s, then get a day off, then go back to 12s. Watch up. Okay. Uh, what was training for the Raven systems like regarding what you were working with? Was it difficult to get to know the aircraft systems uh, where they designed well? It, it was kind of difficult. What we did was condense about two years worth of college level aviation classes into an eight month program. Everything was very rapidly paced. There was little to no room for error. And what made it worse was that my class started training on digital flight controls mm. before the entire fleet had been switched over. So when I got to my duty station at Cannon, uh, the majority of the aircraft still had the old analog flight mm -hmm. control computers. I had to learn all of that on the fly at my squadron, and there was nowhere for us to go to do any kind of uh, maintenance simulator training or anything like that with the older systems. It was basically just having to learn as I went. What year was the, did the switch over begin? I've forgotten now. It started around 1993. Okay, my job. So we, we had a grand we had a grand total of three years for this for all the aircraft to get switched over, and after 1996, the majority of them wound up in the boneyard, mm. and my aircraft wound up there in '98. So mm. it was. I'd say, uh, you know, it, it wasn't the, I don't know if it was the best use of uh, time mm. and funds, but it is what it is. Okay. Next one's going to be hard to answer, but see what you think. What would you remember of F-111? What is your brightest memory of the aircraft or working on the aircraft? I would have to say it would have been from my first day on the flight line. I got to Cannon Air Force Base, got all, you know, got it settled in. And the first thing that they had me do was help recover the aircraft. And to do that, what they would have you do is due to uh, various uh, environmental protection agency uh, regulations, 
we couldn't let any of the jet fuel that got dumped out of the uh, out of these vent ports on the uh, underside of the aircraft. We couldn't let any of that hit the ground and evaporate naturally. That would have created an environmental hazard. The base would have gotten fined. All kinds of other craziness occurred. So what we had to do is uh, crab walk under the aircraft as the engines are still running, hold up a rubber fireproof bucket to mm -hmm. these vents, and the pilots would go up to, you know, mill power up to first stage afterburner, then, you know, bring it all the way back and shut down each engine. And we, and this was all so the engine could dump out maybe one to two ounces of, of jet fuel. Mm -hmm. And we had to catch that. And the entire time, this this aircraft body is just shaking up and mm -hmm. down. So you really had, I mean, one, you had to watch your head. You had to make sure that the pilots didn't, uh, had to make sure that they didn't, uh, oh boy, just, you just wanted to make sure that they didn't do anything too crazy with mm. the, uh, with flight controls. Cause that would move the aircraft mm. up and down to make it worse. You know, all the, all the uh, aircraft deck crew on the super carrier, mm -hmm. they've all got those nice helmets, mm -hmm. you know, your, your bump protection helmets. We didn't get that luxury. So you're standing, you're crouched under this aircraft that's heaving and shaking up and down, trying to hold a bucket on this one vent. So the, uh, so the base doesn't get fined, you know, Mm -hmm. Fifty to a hundred thousand dollars for dumping one ounce of fuel on the ground. That's ridiculous, isn't it? That's crazy. Oh, oh, it, it was. It was absolutely ludicrous. Thankfully, we had some pretty smart people in our squadron who built these uh, spring-loaded stands. Mm -hmm. They stuck the bucket on that, lowered it, moved it there, and that bucket could then just stay attached to the bottom of the mm -hmm. aircraft. And the spring would allow the aircraft to move with less chance of injury to us. Mm -hmm. I just wish it wouldn't have taken until June of 1996 to come out with those. <laughs> mm. Was it how loud was it under there? Because I, I, because you're kind of you're behind the intake, but in front of the actual, you know, the nozzle. Is it just vibration you get down there? It's a lot of vibration. I'd have to say it was probably around 120 to 130 decibels. Mm. Uh, I tell people that's why it takes me so long to talk sometimes because I'm trying to also hear it, you know, inside my inner mm -hmm. ear. It yeah. it will affect your balance a little bit. Also, just having to, you know, just just you know, crouch down and and walk that way that that's heck on your knees. So it's uh, it's difficult sometimes Cause when you think about it. But it's soup. It is loud. It, it'll get up to. I mean. At launch, you'll get up to about 180 decibels. Wow. So one thing yeah. that doesn't come through working on these jets, and I think about people on aircraft carriers, especially that really, you know, have to be next to afterburners and stuff, is the immense, is the sound. I remember I was sat behind a VC-10 on a Bruntingthorpe uh, fast taxi where I got special permission to sit right behind it just to see how loud an engine can actually get. And I had full ear protection on, and still I had to, I was having to kind of, you know, duck away out of it because it's just so loud even through the air pro ear protection it was painfully loud the oh you just that, to run that's away. absolutely correct uh we had we were required to uh double up so we had mm -hmm. foam earplugs that would do about a 35 decibel reduction mm -hmm. on a good day if you in, you know if you wore them inside your ear properly mm -hmm. and then our headsets were also supposed to be you know, noise reducing mm -hmm. by about another by another fifteen to twenty decibels, mm -hmm. uh, depending on which kind you got. If you got the kind with the headset, it was about fifteen decibels less. If you got the ones that didn't have the microphone and and speakers in it, it was about twenty. But normally, you would have your headset on, uh, so you could. Uh, in case you would have to communicate mm. with anyone on inside the aircraft. Mm. So, but it still got loud. It it still got really loud. Yeah, it kind of it's almost like it gets inside your head, and it's crazy, isn't it? It's from... Oh yeah, it's it's uh, they call it infrasound. Mm. Just that real low, slow, mm. uh, deep super bass mm. vibration, basically. Yeah. 
Uh, I remember I remember hearing somebody talk about that dealing with uh, wind generators, wind turbines, okay. living near them, and they got that infrasound, mm. and it was starting to actually cause them health problems. Uh, how about that? Yeah, it was something in England, as a matter of fact. Yeah. I'm not yeah, sure. Lots of them, yeah. I'm not sure where it was, but someone got one built on their property, and started getting ill from the low level vibrations of mm. this wind generator hmm. being so close to their house. Interesting. We got something like that a little more concentrated with the engines. It just didn't, you know, it didn't last hmm. anywhere near as long, thank goodness. Yeah, because they would have had that all the time, yeah. But like, right. when, when you go to an air show as a spe spectator, it's loud, but it's pleasant loud. It's like, yeah, this is cool. But when, you, like, when at your job, when you're working next to these things, it's just pure unpleasantness to the point where you, you know, it's horrible, isn't it? It makes you feel exactly. bad. Exactly. Exactly. It's a it's it's a health hazard and mm. that's why I have difficulty hearing sometimes even with regular conversations. Mm -hmm. I usually have earplugs on there just to, you know, I always I always carry a, a set of foam earplugs with me just to try and retain whatever mm. hearing I have left. Mm -hmm. Also working around working around car engines, especially mm. unmuffled car engines. Mm -hmm working around uh, firearms, working around jet mm. engines. It's, it's taken a pretty, it's taken a pretty good toll on my ears. So mm. I always make sure that to always have some kind of hearing protection with mm -hmm. me just in case I know I'm going to be going into a, a loud room. Mm. Roger. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Right. We went a bit off topic there, but all good. Um, where do we go? Do you think the F-111 in all of its incarnations would fit well in DCS and what would so just this is the f111 not the ef111 i've noticed he's written here what would they bring to the sim in your opinion that's a really good question i mean i answer, don't know i mean an ef111 would bring nothing because there is no ew in dcs there's basically they'd, have, they'd have to fake a system they'd have to fake yeah. a system for that yeah. for the f111 well you see that heat blur has the the f14 mm-hmm and I remember seeing someone, I thought it was also Heat Blur, who did a side-by-side -side seating module for the A6. Mm -hmm. if, you can, if you can figure out how to do the A6 and figure out how to do the F14, you're almost halfway to having an F111. Mm -hmm. I think it would be fun just because of the different types of ordnance you can drop on people. But mm -hmm. people would have to realize it is just a ground attack aircraft. Yeah. You're not going to be launching Phoenix missiles at 120 miles. You're probably not even going to be launching Sidewinders. And if you do, it's because you've either got an extremely lucky shot or you're in a very bad position. Mm. Mostly it's going to be one guy flies around for a long time while the while his right seater locates targets and puts the bomb on the target with the pave tax system. Or if the, if they change the loadout a little bit, one of the, one of the ordinance pieces that I remember seeing us use a lot that I didn't see on a lot of air, other aircraft was the Matra, Durandal anti-runway system. Mm. I think the tornadoes could use them as well, but these were these were ground penetrating bombs just designed to ruin uh, runways. Mm. That would be another thing that it would be pretty good for. As far as anything else, I don't know if I don't know if a lot of people would have a lot of fun with it. That's where that's where I would come from. Is is this going to be mm. fun? for a dedicated simulation pilot to to play mm. if it's not fun because he's not doing piloting and weapons it may not be it may not be as good of a it may not be as good of an experience as we would like it to be it's i would it's a very good point yeah, yeah yeah and that's that's where i would want you know, I would want a lot of testing to make sure mm -hmm. that that no matter which position you take, you're going to have fun with it. If you don't have fun with it, what's 
what's the point really other than mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you know other than literal simulation just trying to see what you can do with it mm. maybe that is fun but mm. for a casual you know for someone who flies casually it may not be that much fun uh, i'd love to see it though mm -hmm. just because that's my you know that's my bird up there uh the one thing that might be nice is everybody complains about the mig-21 being the only one with a, with a nuclear weapon mm. With an F-111, you can get two B-61 nuclear weapons in there. Let's let's escalate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a really interesting point you made there. I've always thought, yeah, it'd be amazing because, especially as a heat blur module, because the kind of modules they do are big and loud and shaky and noisy and smoky. The, Perfect. Yeah, I love their stuff. Yeah, and, and, and it works for some. I mean, you wouldn't want, for instance, a heat blur F-18 because... There's meant to be more of a refined. It's meant to be more of a Wagner plane, basically, and a heat blower F-18. I don't think would be very good. But the planes they've got are perfect, and this suits them perfectly. And in my view, it would be on the positive side. It will be a cross between an AGS-37 and a Tomcat. It's got the AGS-37's ethos of go low, go fast, be loud, drop bombs, but with the twin right. seat kind of capability or feature of the tomcat however something that i never thought about is the negative side which is like you said basically in the grand scheme of things it just dropped bombs it doesn't dogfight it doesn't fire missiles it doesn't fire slams it doesn't fire. you know it just like almost a scaled down vegan in a way it just goes very fast hugs the ground and drops bombs uh are people going to spend 80 dollars on it blah 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 so it's a really good right. point you brought up there Right. The, the, if you wanted to add the C model for, for the Australians as mm. well as the F model, you could also get, I, I forget which one they used, but you could also use it in an anti-ship role. Mm -hmm. So if you really wanted to have fun and have all kinds of surface-to-air missiles launched at you, there you go. You can launch, I think it was the Penguin system that they mm -hmm. had. Mm -hmm. It was either the Penguin or the Popeye, I forget which. They had a uh, they had a they had an anti ship missile that was very very good for what it you know for the time that it was running and actually for I think I think the system's still in use so maybe it was the Popeye system they were using mm -hmm. but I, I can't yeah, I can't be sure no. yeah uh, it's one four AGM never heard of it what well, AGM one four two Popeye whopping great thing I don't know anything about it, it looks awesome as far as weapons look but okay anyway great answers there so if we were going to get one we will presumably want the C model the australian C model for anti-ship and like we said it's basically a vegan on speed if that's the right word basically vegan on steroids basically it, it carries it it will carry a lot if you want to drop if you want to drop a lot of guided munitions mm -hmm. the f-111 is your bird mm -hmm. okay excellent let's uh punch on there uh some interesting thoughts there uh, blah, 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 blah. any stories you can tell us from your times in the air force or ones that we haven't covered so far should i say i will neither confirm nor deny the presence of shenanigans while i was in the air force <laughs> that means yes it was there it, it was there but i probably shouldn't talk about it roger okay uh next one's interesting how was the dump and burn achieved was it just a pipe at the tail of the aircraft or is it more complicated so let me go and get the picture up right that's a that's a fuel dump mast and that's there entirely for getting rid of excess fuel when you're trying to land and also so when you go through a refueling process you don't overfill and rupture the tanks so I am assuming that when they figured out how to do the dump and burn, it was done completely by accident. Someone hit the, mm -hmm. someone hit the dump switch mm -hmm. while they were an afterburner, and somebody behind them saw this <laughs> giant gout of <laughs> flame <laughs> and said, "That's cool. Let's keep doing that." <laughs> so, because what that dump mass does is it, it does spray out the, uh, the fuel, and at the higher speeds when it's in flight you will you'll you'll basically turn it into a nice vapor mm -hmm. and fuel vapor that's what ignites if you take a bucket of jp8 in just liquid form no mm -hmm. vapors anywhere mm -hmm. you can throw lit matches into it all day they'll go out it will not light that 
it has to be in a vapor form for it to catch fire, which is a lot of that always tends that always tends to impress new airmen. My my dad told me about it a long time ago when uh, when he was a crew chief on F fours, and I was yeah I thought I was like okay that's that's kind of neat. And then I saw it for myself, mm-hmm. and it it blew my mind. You know I'm used to seeing you know gasoline going mm-hmm. up you know in a snap, mm-hmm. and here's this jet fuel that's you're you're throwing this out. It's keeping the oxygen away from the flame, so the oxygen goes the flame goes out and. It was it was something to see. Then they turned it into an aerosol mist, and you got this giant fireball. Mm-hmm. When uh, the the worst incident, though, I saw something like that was we had had uh, fuel pump problems on one of the aircraft, and during a refuel, the pump didn't transfer to the wings properly. So all of a sudden, you're just just out of the back of the uh, out of the back of the plane and you just see all this jet fuel just gushing mm-hmm. out of the dump mast and you saw everybody scrambling for every bit of absorbent cloth they could find all the oil dry they could find they're trying to set up you know they tried to they had to set up a uh, special catch barrier for it and I want to say we lost probably about 40 to 50 gallons of jet fuel Mm -hmm. onto the ground and it was it was a nightmare it was an absolute nightmare trying to get all of the paperwork done for it Mm -hmm. just absolute nightmare i didn't realize there's so much red tape in kind of environmental stuff but it sounds like there is (laughs) it's it's bad it's bad when you have military red tape Mm -hmm. but then when you add other government civilian agency red mm-hmm. tape on top of it it gets it gets ridiculous almost to the point where if you if you don't laugh about it you're going to go nuts yeah i think i think that it'd be one of this it feels seems like one of those scenarios look, this job is hard and dangerous enough already and yet you've got me so if i spill a thimble of oil or something you're gonna sue me or something it's like it's it's like it's like the scene in like. ghostbusters when You've got the environmental bureaucrat coming in and saying that they have to shut down their containment field. Mm. Um, and there's a couple more things that are to add. Uh, I mean, public, oh God, public, what's the word? Public kind of support for a plane will always help, uh, I think. It's not massively mm-hmm. important, but, you know, if you can make a plane that pleases, a, a military plane that's there for shooting down jets and stuff like that, it can always help if you get public opinion on its side. And so this thing going around shooting this massive afterburner out has absolutely no positive effect, but it does entertain a crowd. And if a crowd is entertained by a plane, it's got positive opinion about that plane generally. So I reckon that's another idea why, you know, if you can do a party trick, cool, it can help um, keep it in service. And as well as that, just um, you said that the JP-8 would only explode, vaporize, if that's the right word. Is it in the fuel injectors in the engine? Is it vaporized before pre-combustion? I've never, I never even thought about that before. Yeah, it it goes it goes through it goes through fuel injection nozzle, so it it comes out into the combustion chamber in as a uh, as a vapor. Right, because I always pictured it coming out. I always pictured the um, nozzles being so big that it might would come out as like a like a hose pipe, like water coming out of a hose pipe and then just catching fire. But that's not right. Then it gets atomized. If that's you know, for sake of a better word, it's it's yeah, it's standard. Like, like in it's a car. standard internal right. It's standard internal combustion. Right. Just on a really big scale with a mm. lot of tiny nozzles. Mm. How interesting. Right. I'd love to have a look at one of those nozzles one day. To see. Oh, they're awesome. They're absolutely awesome yeah cool all right well let's try and get it back on track uh okay that was that awesome what was the difference in the f-111 systems and airframe construction that make it a unique aircraft in your opinion so not just the raven per se but the aardvark slash the raven uh and i guess there's gonna be a lot because so much stuff was new on this airframe but what's your answer well you're absolutely right it was because everything on here was so new so space age mm. that no one entirely knew how to take care of it. You had to do everything on the fly. And what was great about that was everything they learned on the F-111 
-hmm. that went into the designs yep. of the F-14 and the B-1. Mm -hmm. And those turned out to be fantastic aircraft. That's why we still have the B-1 mm -hmm. in service. I mean, we, yes, we still have the B-52 in service, and that will, you know, I'm pretty sure that the last two, the last two aircraft flying, you know, if 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 the worst comes to worst, the last mm -hmm. two aircraft flying will probably be a Tu-95 Bear and a B-52 Stratofortress. <laughs> yeah, that's funny, isn't it? That's that's just how how it'll go. Um, but due to all the due to all the design plans of the 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 TFX system, you know, that it came under, you had to have something that was a low-level nuclear bomber and a high level interceptor so that would you're you're asking for two separate things out of one aircraft and that made it a lot of, you know that made it a compromise aircraft mm, mm. but you had good range good speed accurate bombing even without the pave tack mm. pod uh this the the e models were fantastic with uh with toss bombing it you know between that the tave Pave tech, the jamming system, it really did kind of make a good show of you know interoperability between services. the The data that the F one eleven series has improved your precision guided munitions, your fuel efficiency, even airframe design. But because it was such a compromise aircraft, everybody got into this mindset of we can't have dedicated fighters we can't have dedicated strike aircraft everything has to be able to do everything and that really causes a lot of problems if you want a very good strike aircraft mm -hmm. you build a strike aircraft mm -hmm. if you want a very good uh, fighter you build a fighter we saw that when the f-22 raptor and the f-35 whatever it is um the the the, the giant single engine you know the, the giant single engine festival of mistakes is about the only way i can i can mm -hmm. explain it um you have the you have the, the 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 raptor there they tried to turn that into a multi-mission aircraft and realized it wasn't going to work so thankfully they've kept that as primarily a fighter mm -hmm. But I think there's probably some light strike capability in it, just in case. The F-35, it's a, uh, it tries to be everything because it's trying to fulfill multiple missions from multiple services. Whenever you get something like that, you're going to have a lot of compromises. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's just kind of, that, that's a, that's a, that's an even longer rant for a later day. <laughs> Roger. Okay. But yeah, this is the F-1111. For all its problems, I'd consider it a real stepping stone. One of those planes that's a big stepping stone in technology. And oh, it definitely you know, was. It definitely every was. Or every five years. I mean, I mean, take take a look at everything that you were able to do with the with the tornado. Mm. Had it not been for the F-111 working as a as a flying test bed, mm. the the tornado wouldn't be as improved of an aircraft as it was. Mm-hmm. More jump. Okay, we'll push on. Uh, was the range of the Raven's pods, and I'm guessing we're talking EW here, was, sorry, what was the range of the Raven's pods, if you even knew, was it supposed to stay with the attack aircraft, or was it to follow behind at a distance and still do its job? I'm kind of sure the range is classified. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't tell you what it is. I've heard rumors, I've heard stories, most of which I, I don't consider to be true. So the only thing I could give is basically, if, if I gave any kind of rage estimation, it would be based off of urban legends. So mm. I, I really don't, I really don't think I could give a good answer to it. Mm. I mean, they, we, might not, they might not have been an answer. It might, you know, slowly drop off every mile. It gets less and less effective, and there may not be an answer. Right. It's 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 just like it's just like your standard. It's just like a standard radio wave or standard radar wave. Yeah. The the one urban legend that got passed along with us was when the Ravens were still stationed at Nellis. Someone caused a malfunction with the weight on wheels switch during a 
during a transmission check mm, of the band one and band two radar jammers. And according to the urban legend, this aircraft that was on the ground at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas was able to jam Los Angeles International. Now, you can tell it's an urban legend because for it to do that, it would have had to it would have had to be it would have had to have generated way more power than than the aircraft could. Mm. Also, it would have to go through mountains because it was sitting on the mm -hmm. ground at the time. Mm. So as far as that goes, it's it's very much, you know, every bit the urban legend of this, you know, this this plane was capable of of, you know, hitting these things so far away. Mm. If it was at altitude, sure, maybe it could. But on the ground, no. Um it, it wasn't it wasn't that so all i know is like i said i i've shared an urban legend here and nothing you know any anything for the actual alq 99 system classified i wouldn't know it uh i i was never i was never given the the clearances to to know what it was i'm not even convinced the people who made it would really know because it's, it's a two-way game is yes they're doing the jamming but it's just as much about how the hostiles react to that jamming, how their anti-jamming systems are, and their counter countermeasures are. Right. You know what I right, mean? So it's, I'd, I'd imagine it's a, it's, it's a very dynamic answer to that question. Yeah, and, and it even changed our tactics. We went from we went from leading the aircraft in entirely right onto the mm. target. Mm. Uh, they went to going to leading the the strike package in then breaking off and circling mm -hmm. so that's that's what came about from learning about things like burn through like you showed mm -hmm. on your f-15 uh mm -hmm. video mm -hmm. okay and that's really about it okay the answer is we don't know <laughs> we know general ideas but that's about it which is what the, 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 the answer is we only get to know if we're allowed to know. <laughs> sure. Okay, and we're not, <laughs> clearly. Um, question 28. Can you tell us a bit more about the sensor array on the Raven and how capable it was? Pretty much the same answer, I guess, but what do you think? Uh, no, I think they might have been talking about radar here. Oh. The the radar system on the... The radar system on the EF was nowhere near what you had for the, the TFX design. The TFX design had a uh, had basically the AWG nine that we know in the in the mm, Tomcat. Yeah, yeah. That that's what it was supposed to have. For our strike radar, for the for the F models, they had what was called the APQ one thirteen, and that was man, I I really don't know how to explain that other than. Everything you saw on the A four E for its for its terrain radar, mm -hmm. it was a much improved version of that. Mm -hmm. As far as the EF, the only radar that they had was just for navigation. Uh, they did not have any kind of they didn't have any kind of uh, threat radar or anything like that. I mean, they had a threat warning system, of course, you know, radar warning system. But they didn't have any kind of target tracking radar, if you will. Mm. Nothing, nothing like nothing like uh, the fighters that uh, that we have in in the in uh, DCS. Yeah. It was strictly it was strictly na navigation, which was perfect for the EF because the EF really wasn't designed to go into combat. It was mm -hmm. designed to go around combat. Mm. More job. Cool. Okay. Right, let's punch on. Uh, what systems were operated by the second crew member? And what was his what was his name, by the way, if you know what I mean? Was he Rio? Was he what was he? Well you had in the in the, the strike models, he was the weapon systems operator Wizzo. Mm -hmm. And then in the EF you had the electronic warfare officer. So what they would have is you would have the and this this is why I wish I had the pictures of the cockpits available mm. for you because they are actually laid out separately from they're 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 two different two different layouts completely 
the F model had the, you know, it had the, instead of the nice uh, multifunction display that mm -hmm. you see on your F-16 or your mm -hmm. A-10, it had this viewport. Yeah, I'm looking at it. That the that the that the Wizzo would look mm -hmm, through, mm -hmm. and on the EF, you had this giant CRT screen that took mm -hmm. up the majority of the aircraft, or the majority of the right side, and on top of that, the control system it used. Oh, I see it. Yeah, you had to. Yeah, you had to remove the. Yeah, you had, you had to remove the 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 right mm -hmm. uh, the right seater stick. stick. Yeah, and it was. As a matter of fact, you even moved over all of mm. the you moved over all the engine instruments. As you can see mm. on that one in the upper right hand corner, see how the engine instruments are in the center of mm. the uh, mm. on the EF. They're moved over to the the pilot's uh, left hand side, mm -hmm. and yep. I'm trying to see if we've got anything that's even ah, it's the there we go yeah. Right there, as you can see, you've got that control panel where the stick used to be. Mm -hmm. You've got the engine instruments moved all the way over to the left. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the only instrument you really can't see there is the uh, bearing distance heading indicator. Mm -hmm. That's over on the far right hand side. That was one of our that that was one of our backup systems mm -hmm. for uh, for navigation for the pilot. Mm -hmm. But the electronic warfare officer could also use that to show the direction of his of his antennas. Roger. Can you see my um, cursor wiggling about, or is that not? Yes. Displayable? Yeah, I, I can see that. There? Is that a traditional RWR? Just peel out of interest. Um, or is it something let else? Let me take a look. The uh, which which part were you were you trying to serve? I'm, I'm right in the middle there. If you can see my cursor, it'll be obvious yeah. on the stream. If not, it just looks okay. like an RWR with threat rings. I thought, oh, is that not RWR? Where that is, um, you've got your your navigation radar. That's kind of the the tan one, the navigation mm -hmm. radar. Oh. Right below that, yeah, yeah right. that's that's your yeah. RWR right there. All right, how about that? Yeah, yeah. Yep, that's that's just like the old. That's it's like the one off the F five kind yeah, of. Yeah, Roger. Yeah. Yeah, you know, similar display, probably different electronics, mm -hmm. but similar display. Then you had your electronic warfare screen. You had your terrain following screen. Mm -hmm. Actually, no. The 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 one that's sort of the tan color. That's your terrain following radar, Roger. and the other is your nav radar. Roger. Then you had your instrument cluster down the center for the pilot. Yeah. Which had his uh, ADI, his HSI. You know, one ADI on top of the HSI. Then you had your airspeed altitude, and your. I want to say something. You had your a. It's it's been a long time since I worked on these. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like there's uh, altitude basic, basic altitude it's indicator. Basic yeah, you had your altitude tapes. Yeah, it was it was interesting to work in. But mm -hmm. yeah, if you can see where that uh, where that stick is and yeah. where the uh, where the seat is, yeah, imagine having to get around that to fix those rudder pedals. Yeah, I can see I can see how you'd be upside down and and kind of in there. There's a small control stick. I'm assuming for the. EW guy between precariously between his ejection handles is that to control his his big screen? I, I believe that might have been for some uh, that that was something to deal with what navigation, I believe. Roger. And as you can also see with that, yeah, that's a that's an older model, mm. or I, I should say an older model, but that cockpit hasn't gone through the multifunction display recent. Mm. Uh, hasn't gone through that upgrade yet mm. so that's that was some of the first ones that that i'd seen but they had as part of the amp program the they switched over to some primitive mfds and mm -hmm. that would have that would have carried that most yeah. of the yeah. at the bottom of the electronic warfare officers console there uh in the center there's a tiny little controller over uh, keep going to your right. It's it's the it's where the stick would have been for the right seater. Yeah. Where his his uh, control panels are. Mm. There was a small controller there that worked similar to a trackball. Oh, and I think that's I see it, yeah. Yeah. That's that's where that would have gone. Hmm. 
Interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, if we did get this in DCS, I mean, I like this old school. I like this old school 60 setup with big, big scopes and stuff like that. I, would, I know most people would disagree with me, but if we did get one, I'd, I'd, want, I'd want this old one with all the old stuff on it um, rather than the modernized 93 plus version. But um, that's just my personal it's... opinion. It's it's interesting to to see, but what's nice about the the MFDs is being able to get all your various aircraft and navigation data through it. It mm. really it really helped out with mm. just making the aircraft more livable, if for lack of a better of course, word. Of course, of course, yeah, absolutely, no, no, no doubt about it. Um, looking at an MFD version here, so a whole load, hundreds of those controls have disappeared, just with too little. OSB MFD screens here. Yep, absolutely, absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Anyway, let's push on. Uh, right. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The narrow ray dome under the fuselage and a pod on top of the vertical stabilizer were adding around, well, 3.5 tons to the airframe. How was the stability affected and regulated? So for the EW stuff, I'm guessing that we're talking about. Okay. As I like to say it, it's it's engineering magic. So you got this big thumping thing on the tail here, and this the funny thing underneath. Mm. Right, and it it is purely due to the. It's it's a testament to everyone who worked on that that adding all that extra weight and all that extra drag, you still were able to get a good high speed aircraft out mm. of it. Mm. That's that's the only way I can really describe it. Uh, the plane still would handle, as the pilots would usually say, it flies like a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. So it flies really, really smooth. But don't expect any, don't expect any sudden, sudden turns or the ability to move quickly. Mm -hmm. You're you're driving a large sedan. You're not driving a sports mm -hmm. car. Mm -hmm. it, it it wasn't designed for maneuver or you know, it wasn't designed for for maneuver fights or turn fights mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. So that's why I always got kind of ticked off that it had a that it had an F designation. Yeah, I know. F for fighter it. doesn't make any sense. But it 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 only makes sense in the context of the time mm -hmm. because we didn't really want the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact to know that we had another high speed nuclear bomber to replace mm -hmm. the B fifty eight. Mm -hmm. So we called it F for fighter. Mm -hmm. Even though it didn't really have a, it didn't really have a any kind of fighting capability. Mm -hmm. Once that got, once the Navy decided they weren't going to take the uh, the program any further, along with the Air Force, so it probably should have been given an, an A for attack, or even a, even a B for bomber uh, designation. Mm -hmm. It. An A designation, I think, probably would have been the best just to mm. tell them, oh, yeah, this is totally just merely a conventional aircraft. You don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. But at the time, the Air Force wanted to, they wanted to streamline their designation process. So even things like the old A-26 Invader that they were still using in Vietnam mm -hmm was given a B for bomber designation, even though it really Vader? did. It's it's an old World War II aircraft. Uh, it was the successor to the A-20 Havoc. Right, okay. Okay, anyway, uh, anyway, yep, I just wanted to... But that's, that's some, that's some okay, other thing, yeah. too, so... Roger, cool. Okay, very good. Uh, the next question is, could you explain a bit more about the AMP, the Avionics Modernizing Program from 1903 onwards, which systems it affected? Well, it lasted almost 20 years, so it affected oh, wow. <laughs> just about every everything on the air I mean, freight. Sorry, and even that it wasn't com even that it wasn't completed. Before you get going, I just I just found it amazing how the again the, the same thing with the A to B upgrade in the Tomcat. You know, when they think about when when you say it and you think about it, you, you think they got it done in one summer or something. But there were still right, A's flying years. like twenty years afterwards. They the program takes decades or years. Right, that's why they had the A plus. And just imagine how complicated that makes things, like training, like you said, and the complications that that, make, that makes. But anyway, it is what it is. But sorry, please continue. Right, and and the big problem with the 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 aircraft 
Yeah, but the amp was it wasn't completed by the time the airframe had retired. So the frames mm -hmm. the frames actually were starting to wear out before the electronics were. Uh, I don't know. And I think that had the F one eleven not been a line item in the old strategic arms limitation talks of the early seventies if they would have been able to build more after 1976 the the you know the the improvement program would have shown a complete switch to a very primitive glass cockpit mm -hmm. and even if they'd been able to maintain maintain the uh the airframe program further you might have seen a total glass cockpit like we see on the on the JF17 mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been very happy about that just because I always like having mechanical gauges there for backup, but you could have seen something very similar to that if they would have still been building into the, into the eighties or even nineties. Mm. Mm. Okay. But no, it got, uh, it got knocked out of the, it got shut down due to uh, nuclear warfare mm. limitation talks mm. and that, also really hamstrung the the aircraft as well yeah roger i mean losing losing the aardvark slash raven or it's losing the aardvark to me was just the same as losing the f-14 it's a, it a big big thing all right mm. okay let's push on the raven uh has two hard points hard points in which it can mount with two A9 Sidewinders or two 600 gallon, which is very big, external fuel tanks. But I've never seen a Sidewinder on a Raven. And lots of articles were saying it was defenseless. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? There was one time that we hung an AIM-9 on, a, on an EF. So it can be done. We oh, can. It, you, you can actually hang anything on those pylons mm. that you want. The big problem was that the aim nine that we hung on there it was it was a live you know it was a live missile and everything like that but we didn't have the wiring mm -hmm. to actually attach to the to yeah. that so we did it for a, a, right the only reason why we hung that aim nine on there was basically as a joke mm -hmm. in a squadron photo that we did of mm -hmm. all of us mm -hmm. and that is the 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 two pylons that it had the only thing you could put on there were travel pods. Mm -hmm. So if you see an EF-111 with something on those pylons, the only payload that those things have are the air cruise golf clubs. Yeah. That's, that's basically it. Um, there wasn't anything that the EF could do other than run. Away. run. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got that. That's how we got that maneuver kill. Yep, yep. But I've still got to redo that somehow in DTS, but yeah. Yeah, it was... Basically, you're going to have to find a pilot who thinks he's really good, but isn't very good. And that's that's how you yeah. would get the... That's, that's how you'd get that... That's how you'd get that maneuver kill. Gotcha. That, that'd be about the only way you could do it. Um, you know, basically basically having, having more guts than brains. And that that would be about it. Okay, so the answer is, and I didn't know this, no, it, it's a myth, um, and that's how it is. But the funny thing I see, think about that is the kind of jokes we do in Grim Reapers are like we, I don't know, mess around in a video game. The kind of jokes that you guys did were to steal a live aim line sidewinder and stick it on a plane that it couldn't fire it. <laughs> well, that, 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 was, that was actually, that was that actually kind of a joke. request of the photographer. No? That was a okay. photographer's request because mm -hmm. he just thought that the pylon looked weird without anything on it. Mm -hmm. And we said... Well, let's let's get let's let's give our weapons guys something to do other than change out the chaff and flare. Mm. So, how do you guys feel about hanging an AIM nine on this? Mm -hmm. So we we borrowed one from one of the F sixteen units. We put it up there, and that got the whole that got the whole thing going again about whether or not the the EF was wired to fire harms or mm. strikes, mm. which that would have been kind of cool if it was. But it wasn't. We just didn't have the we didn't have the wiring in mm -hmm. there, and most of the plumbing for fuel tanks had gone as well. Mm -hmm. So literally, all those are were just for cargo pods. That mm -hmm. was it. So just literally aluminium mounts end, basically. Mm. Okay, very good. That's lovely myth cleared up. 
33, can you tell us a bit more about the AN, ALQ99 Echo jamming system on the Ravens? I mean, you've been asked this about three times, but anything you want to add so far? Other than it's really, really secret enough that I couldn't check out any of the tech orders, I, I really can't add anything else. Mm -hmm. And the version that they're showing on the on the Growler, the uh, the F-18 that had been heavily modified to become a electronic warfare aircraft, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you can show it that it's kind of showing its age. Mm -hmm. Because it's still uh, the it's still the same system, it's still, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's still the ALQ ninety nine. It's it's, when, it's an improved old. version, mm. but it's still showing its age. And just like it, just like the Prowler that it succeeded, mm. you get a big trade off because of the aircraft type that you're using. Mm. It's not a dedicated electronic mm -hmm. warfare aircraft. It's also a seed aircraft as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. If you put harms on that aircraft you take away jamming pods mm -hmm. if you take away jamming pods that's fewer radar that's fewer radars that you can engage mm. yes you can destroy a bunch of radar but you also wind up being able to jam fewer fewer installations and you're a you're less able to cover more bands of radar as well so again it's a trade-off. The EF, if it would have been wired to fire harms or, or strikes, would have been better for it just because it can carry a bunch of things in the internal bay while also being able to hang stuff off the wings. That would have been the, the only thing. But when you have these pods of, for the ALQ-99 that you have to put onto a pylon, that takes away weapon space. So... The ALQ-99 is probably still showing, you know, it's it's probably showing its age by now, but it's still, it can still soldier on after all these years. Roger. Okay. So next we've got, what about the ALQ-137 self-protection system and the and an ALR-62 terminal threat warning system capable of? So I'm guessing the 62, is that the old WR? Honestly, those weren't my area of specialty, so I, I really couldn't. I really couldn't yeah. give a good, educated guess as to those. Those were more. Those were again part of. So these what were we called C shop, and mm -hmm. those were the the communication, navigation, and ECM, and most of your defensive systems. They either went to our radar specialists or they went to our comnav ECM guys, working. In working in flight controls as I did, I really, I really wouldn't want to give an answer on this because I didn't really work around those as much as I would like to. Usually, what they would do is they'd have us, they'd have us work on individual problems and send out another crew to work on a different problem. And it was very rare that you would have you'd have two or three shops working on the same aircraft unless it was an absolutely mm -hmm. mission critical aircraft. Okay. So usually it would be if the radar guys have all their stuff done, once they get their stuff, you know, they'll, they'll leave, they'll leave the necessary stuff open for us. We'll go in and fix it after that. And that was less to, you know, that, that was, I think it was less of a security measure and more of a safety measure because you don't want to have radar guys running radar when you have us running our, our flight control systems just because there's going to be a lot of moving surfaces. There's going to be a lot of, yeah, there's going to be a lot of microwave radiation from the radar and you're going to try and minimize as many dangerous effects towards the, the ground crews as you could. So really couldn't tell you other than it made, you know, when you got to see it lit up and everything like that, it was very pretty. I'm gonna jump. So, uh, as a guess, the ALQ one three seven is gonna be a self protection jammer, uh, to you know purely for to protect us, similar to the ones in the right. A10. It's it's similar. It's similar to the it's similar to the one thirty one pod, and yeah, right. the F model. The F models, I think, actually did carry the one thirty ones for a while. More they jam. might have upgraded, but for the for the EF, it was pretty easy to just put out such a broad array of a broad spectrum of jamming that you would likely, you'd likely get some, some aircraft radar 
in the in the mix there you'd be able to jam some of that as well okay so the next next question was how do you get to the i know again this isn't you but i imagine maybe you saw in some of the other shops how they get access to work on the tail pod it's because there's a big heavy the unit the, yeah, we had yeah. special we had a special hydraulic uh basically a hydraulic staircase that got yeah, up there right. and actually i did we did have a couple of things up there that we worked on mm -hmm. one of which was for the auxiliary flight reference system that was your backup to your ins navigation system Roger. and they both used the exact same type of gyro compass mm -hmm. up there we we always called it we always joked and called it the flux capacitor mm -hmm. um but what you would do is you had the INS closer to the front of the of the football. Our AFRS compass was closer to the back. And what you would do is you would you could actually you could actually hot swap them if uh, if you were trying to if you're trying to see whether or not the whether or not the whether or not that that sensor, whether or not that that compass was going bad, and if it went bad, then what you would do is you would take that out, replace it, drag this, drag the aircraft out to the most magnetically neutral place we could find on base, and you would do an eight to twelve hour compass swing, mm -hmm. and that just involved you moving the aircraft ever so slowly around this on the inside of this giant circle, and. I had to do that maybe twice and it was painful. It, it was it was very interesting but it was also very boring at the same time why would you have to do that um you'd have to do that in what they call the compass rows and it was basically where you would just swing the aircraft around to make sure that the mm. to make sure that the the ins and the afrs sensors at the top of the aircraft mm -hmm. were they that the gyros were functioning properly mm, mm. and that's how you recalibrated them mm. and it it took it took all day roger okay interesting um so that was that question but yeah the awesome bit of information uh, just one tiny little thing i may have lost the picture now but i've just looked in the back of that tail pod and it's got a little glass thing in the back what's that i don't know if you see my screen it might be a bit out of date but yeah um what that is is the tail light? Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. That'll be that's, that one. Then. That's all that is. It's the tail light. I thought it was going to be some super high tech gadget to spy, or I don't know, some sort of a rear firing thing. laser. Yeah, something like. That. Right. We'll ignore that one. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, I've lost my position. How do I access there? A lot of the equipment was placed in the internal. Yeah, this is interesting. So a lot of the EW went in the internal weapons bay because there's lots of room. But was the canoe-shaped radome underneath in any in the way if you would need to work on the equipment in the bomb bay? Did you have to remove the radome before opening the bomb bay on the ra Raven? Again, not really your area, but anything you know about. Actually, it, it, it is the stuff that was inside it. Most of the stuff that was inside it was not really my my area of expertise mm -hmm. but i did have one component in there it was the yaw rate gyro part mm -hmm. of the flight control system that we had to every so often replace or rewire and what you would do is you would open up the the remnants of the bomb bay doors mm -hmm. those would come out and then the radium the the canoe you mm -hmm. would just lower that to a safe area and you would put a couple of braces on it to lock it in place mm. and what was really fun was watching the aircraft when you did the the yaw rate gyro checks because you'd actually unbolt it and you would move it back and forth mm. just you know in a standard plane and you just watch the you'd watch the rudder move back and forth mm. and if it did that then that was still a functioning gyro you put it back in mm. you did your step you did your stab aug and flight control check, and that was that was pretty much it. More job. So most of that Bombay was non EW then for the Raven. For the Raven, it was it was all electronic warfare in there. So oh, it was right. Sorry. Yeah. Was that? Um, as a matter of fact, what you're seeing here uh, in the in the original Bombay that mm -hmm. is more of an E model or a C mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. So you're you would you wouldn't have any of that space there. Mm. 
Uh, it will be it will be Gubbins in there. Super, yeah, super yeah. Proxy. Basically, yeah. That okay. that's actually that that is the term we used for it was the Gubbins. <laughs> So you you could you can tell that our guys had been at Lake and Heath and Hayford for a long time. <laughs> Roger. Okay. Very good. Right. Uh, we should push on. Um, can you actually tell us what equipment was installed in the bomb bay and was it not getting too hot? So expansion of what we just talked about. Really, um, there's stuff in the bomb. I mean, I'm guessing. Uh, I can see if I can get any pictures, but I'm guessing there are going to have to be loads of heat sinks in that Bombay as well. It, it could it could get very hot in there. While I don't entirely know what was going on inside the inside the transmitter boxes, I do remember seeing the I do remember seeing the some of the warnings on there, and one of them was that you could reach temperatures up to 300 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. So you're nearly melting al aluminium at that point, not quite. But. Right, right. So it got very, very hot. You had to have a lot of coolant going through there. I'm not sure how they did it. They also had an air conditioning system that went through there mm -hmm. to just, you know, move all that hot air away. Um, and I remember those, if they didn't have the, if they didn't have the, the transmitters there, they would put a ballast plate in there. Mm -hmm. And I want to say those ballast plates ran around, I want to say they ran around 300 kilos. Mm -hmm. And that, and they were just these huge plates of steel. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons I remember it is one of the guys who I went through basic training with, who unfortunately followed me around from base to base, he was a, he was a, he was an ECM specialist. And his first day on the on the job, they were moving a ballast plate. They were replacing one of the transmitters with a ballast plate for one of the training missions they were running. One of the studs that held the ballast plate in place snapped. Oops. And this moron tried to catch it. Oh, God. And he lost part of his finger from it. Hmm. And when I got there, everybody said, hey, did you go through basic with this guy? And I said, unfortunately, yes. And suddenly, you know, I got I got crapped on for all this guy's failings. So one of the things is choose your words carefully. If you find out that a guy's a real screw up, sometimes you just have to sit there and go, "No, man, never heard of him." Mm. You know, oh, oh, we were in the same unit. Oh, we 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 were we went to we went to basic together. Oh no, I, I don't know. Oh, we went to we went to tech school together. Oh, I, I couldn't tell you. Oh, we we were in the same dorm room. No, no, never, never, never knew him. Never knew him. Never said a thing. So yeah, so sometimes sometimes uh, sometimes sometimes the, the the stupid moves of other people can can also affect you. But uh, yeah, he he actually tried he actually tried to catch one of these giant steel plates because he was worried that it would it would damage the floor, and I just was thinking, dude, let it damage the floor. That's what we have. That's what we have base engineers for. They'll come in, they'll fix the floor, everything is fine. So yeah, that's that that's what you found in that's what you found in the in the in the belly radome there. Hmm. Okay. Well, I haven't found any pictures of the Raven Bombay, so I'm guessing it's still classified because there's just nothing there on the internet. Yeah, it's there. There's probably some photos of it, but it's you know, imagine if you will, just a bunch of big gray boxes lined up in a row, and mm. that there you go. Not, not, nothing very interesting to the casual observer like us. Okay. Um. No. Nothing. I mean, maybe the antennas would look kind of cool, but that would be about it. And even then, you'd be sitting there going. Is that really a radar antenna? You know, mm -hmm. that would be about it. Okay. Just looking at the front construction of the Bravo compared to the, you know, the Air Force version. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's got that, that shorter one, right? Mm -hmm. And just to think that that would have, they could have fit an AWG nine in there. So mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. we, we, could, we could have had some offensive capability, but it wasn't to be, I'm afraid, boys. No, nope, um, unfortunately. What is the ring laser gyro inertial navigation system and how does it operate? A ring laser gyro and inertial INS. 
I don't know what that term means, but that's... It was basically, it used a laser beam to determine, you know, what your flattened level was. And as you moved the gyro, it would interrupt the, the beam because mm -hmm. it went through all these reflectors. You can actually look, you can actually look up the, the ring laser gyro on, on Wikipedia mm. and it doesn't go into the full system, of course, but it, mm -hmm. it tells you how it works and everything like that. Mm. But that was, that was only on the D model. And apparently, according to the guys who worked on the D model, it was it was no good. The hmm. technology, the, the, the ring laser gyro outpaced all the other technology, even the stuff that would be needed to repair it. So it was constantly down for repair, constantly causing problems, simply because they didn't have a good way to maintain it and they didn't have a good way to... They, they didn't have good ways to maintain it. They didn't have good ways to keep it from damaging itself. Uh, mm -hmm. It just, it, it, it got replaced when the, when the E and F models came out. So what are they using nowadays? Is, they, is it caught up now? So are using lasers or? It's, we're, we're using just standard GPS transmitters. Uh, this, the only difference is that, uh, Unlike the unlike the transmitters that we have on our phones, we can't fit it in our pocket, and mm. that's really about it. I'd love to. I need. I'd love to do some research and, and uh, video about the problem INS systems. Of course. Uh, anyway, not for today. Not for today. Let's carry yeah, on. Yeah. Um, actually, actually, if you guys want to take a look at how these things work, mm. um, there is a great channel from uh, what's from a place here in the U.S. called Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. Mm -hmm. And they have, it's it's mostly set up for people who are just learning how to fly. So basically, it's kind of, if you want to fly a Cessna, here's the stuff you're going to see. But it goes through everything on how the pedostatic system works. It goes through a lot of how gyros work and how they work for the aircraft. Hmm. And you get an idea of the internals of the instruments that I used to work on. Hmm. And I would I would suggest that to anybody out there. If you are interested in how these systems work, go to, um, it's actually on their YouTube channel. You can just look up Embry-Riddle. That's E-M-B-R-Y. Oh, really? oh, yeah, I know about Riddle. Riddle. Yeah, yeah. we got a guy from Riddle. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, em yeah Embry-Riddle yeah. Aeronautical. Yeah, yeah. Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Um, actually, hang on a minute. Let me see if I can find Roger. No, that yeah we've got a couple of guys that are there in school there at the moment so i know all about it yeah and it's here we go okay it is the channel is called erau mm -hmm. special vfr it's basically your visual flight rules but it will go over things like your, if you go into the videos, it'll show all kinds of stuff like holding patterns, um, I, aircraft performance and limitations, hydraulic systems, electrical systems, engines, even aeromedical factors, your oil system. It goes through all kinds of really good stuff and mm. trying to see if it can find my... See if I can find the stuff I was watching earlier. Yeah, it's got it's it's about a nine minute long, about you know eight and a quarter minutes long, just on pedostatic instruments. Mm. And then there's another one that's about eight minutes long as well about gyroscopic instruments. Mm -hmm. And it's it'll it'll show you exactly what I was it'll show you exactly what I was looking for or mm -hmm. what you know some of the okay. things I worked on. This so from really need to take a look at that. Okay, we've got that link for the valuable views. Let's punch on for now. Was the GPS system in the Raven capable in all weather conditions and accurate? So this would be a fairly early GPS then. Uh, it, did this come along with the upgrade, or was this something that was later added after the upgrade, or do we know about the GPS? It was, uh, like I said, it, it was it was as accurate as our as our phone GPS systems are. So it was down to about it was down to about five feet. And the only difference was you just couldn't fit it in your pocket. Yeah. But the guys who worked on it, it could be a pain because they had to wait for, 
they had to wait for satellite um, uplinks to go. Uh, the satellite uplinks were a lot slower than they are now. So that would be about it. Mm -hmm. Just just having to, just having to wait for every just having to wait to to get your alignment. Sometimes it would it took longer than it took longer than it does now. I mean, you 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 open your phone, Second you go to maps, thing. boom, you're there. It took a little longer on on these systems, but other than that, it was just as ac it was probably a little more accurate than than most of your phone systems you are. Know, contemporary aircraft CF eighteen, CF sixteen, C eight, and C. The GPS system works hand in hand with the INS system. Uh, they talk together and update each other. That's how this worked as well. That was the same. So it was it was integrated. Yes. How interesting. Right. Okay. All right. Very good. Anyway, that's punch on. But so it sounds like it's a um, a slightly earlier version of, of what we were looking at on a, on a very modern plane, two thousands. Basically, plane. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. Okay, anyway, let's punch on. Was the environmental system able to cool down all the equipment in the Raven? Well, I guess yes, obviously. But there were tons of heat emissions in flight and active duties. I don't understand the question. Do you get the question 40? Oh, but, yeah. no. So I'm just saying there was I, lots I, of heat I emissions. It, but yeah, it, it, got, it got hot. We had to, we had to build... Uh, well, it wasn't that we had to build, but the the companies who came up with the a lot of the electronic systems, they all work together to set up as part of our aerospace ground equipment, a portable air conditioning unit. And what you had to do with that was you hooked that up to one of the, you hooked that up to a port in the front of the aircraft. And then you took your, your aircraft start unit, we call it a dash 60. You would take the bleed air hose from the dash 60 as that's what we used. We used a, a bleed air system to start our engines. You would take that hose and instead of hooking it up to the, the bleed air port on the engine, you would hook it up to this bleed air port on this air conditioner. And the bleed air that came off of the Dash 60 would go into the air conditioner and provide cool air the entire time. That way you didn't burn your systems out on the ground. That was mostly for radar and ECM, but once we got digital flight controls we started having to use it as well. So a lot of the older hands in B shop didn't like that because it was one more thing that we had to deal with. And I just kind of chalked it up as well. It's, it's an electronic system. It's going to have to, if it's not as, if it's not as heat tolerant as the old systems were, that's just what we have to do. And you don't want your you don't want to fry your your digital flight control computer. My job. Okay, so let's punch on. I was just skipping ahead. Um, for an aircraft with well, no defensive capabilities, pretty much. Um, to do, like in terms of missiles, um, was there sufficient amount of chaff and flares? First, we had the the ALE twenty eight, and that was real similar to what you had on the F five. So you had, you could mix, you know, you could put chaff in one, flares in the other, and not have a lot of each. And that was a, uh, that was a percussion system. So you actually had to have primer charges on each of those, on each of those yeah. chaff and flare modules. Yeah. And it would literally sw swing that cartridge out a hammer would hit it. It would go off like a it'd go off like a okay. pistol Basically, and yeah. scatter stuff. And there was a there was a special there's a special catching tray that you had to put next to the next to the aircraft mm. whenever they did checks on those ALE twenty eights and all of a sudden mm. you just hear from our sisters just, just it sounded like a machine gun going off. Mm. Uh, whenever they had to test it. Eventually they upgraded that to what was called the ALE forty. And that put these um, that put these blocks about the size of probably about a probably about the size of a rugby ball. These and they were blocks filled with chaff and flare modules, mm. and it I want to say it tripled the amount of, mm -hmm. of defensive munitions we had, and instead of being uh, percussion launched as mm. they were they were actually just electronically launched yeah. 
had a small electronic primer, it got an electrical charge, and out it went. Mm. So much easier to fix, a lot fewer, you know, way, way fewer mm. mechanical mm -hmm. parts to fail, so much nicer. That was about it. <laughs> very good. Okay, yeah, I've just been reading through that. Okay, very good. Um, next question is, the TF30, uh, is it a turbo fan or a turbo jump? I'm pretty sure it's one of the first turbo fans. Yeah, it's, a, it's an afterburning turbo fan. Yeah. So that was, yeah, absolutely. Which means, obviously, it's got a small bypass of cold air going over the side. Okay, I don't right. think we'll expand on that. Uh, well, unless it's specifically anything you want to say about the TF30 version of that. Uh, not really. Not really. It's it's your it's your bog standard uh, bog standard turbo fan with afterburner. Roger, uh, we've been through. We went through it quite. Uh, the TF30 went through it a lot in part one, so we won't do any of that. Okay, very good. Was the escape pod to retain some comms and power after ejection? So we'd have to have a battery, as it was much bigger than a single ejection seat. And can you tell us what systems were still powered, if any? There you might have been. Been a battery-operated radio beacon and maybe some maybe some small radio comms, mm -hmm. but nothing else was powered that I would know of. Mm -hmm. The only other item that you had in there that was, you know, not even powered for that, you had your you had your uh, your impact attenuation bags, which would pop out mm -hmm. underneath the underneath the the thing, so. As it, was power, yeah, yeah. as it was parachuting down, I th and I think those actually opened up with small explosive charges. Yeah, uh, just to just to inflame, kind of like mm -hmm. kind of like airbags yeah, in, right. uh, in modern cars, because mm -hmm. that's basically what it was: was giant airbags. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you would have that, so you'd have, probably have a small electrical charge for to to detonate mm -hmm, those charges. Mm -hmm. And then the only other thing that it had besides those, you might have like I said a small battery radio, but usually you'd have a pilots would have a survival radio in their kit right and then you would also have the mechanical bailing system in case of a water landing so should the That's aircraft funny. start to should the yeah. aircraft land the pod land in the water you would have some neutral buoyancy from the impact attenuation bags but if you started taking on water you could move the stick back and forth and mm. you could actually pump water out of the cockpit Clever, isn't it yeah, and I think that was a purely mechanical system. I don't think there was anything mm -hmm. electrical involved with that. Mm -hmm. I think the less electrical stuff, the better uh, in a case like this. Um, when, when survival yeah. when, when survival is going, yes. One question. Who, in a modern contemporary fighter plane, you've got a guy called an ejection seat specialist or something like that. We've had one on. He just deals with ejection seats because it's a complex piece and it needs, you know, it needs a team to oh, look yeah. after it. So who was looking after the pod you know, yeah, in your case, because there's no ejection seat in this plane. So is there a man that looks after the pod? Yes, we had uh, we we had a good size. We, we actually had a lot of, uh, and I, I'm trying to remember what the actual term was because it's been well over 20 years. Mm. I would, I want to say it was just, it wasn't electro environmental. It was it was egress systems. It was our egress system specialists, and they would make sure that everything inside that pod was taken care of in, in case of an ejection. Mojo, that's a big pod. It's a mess, uh, bigger than a car. Yeah, it's, it it was about uh, it was about the size of your your average mini. Mojo. Now the interesting thing is all of those systems. Everything has been done from inside that cockpit. And the whole thing severs. So is that like where? So there's no mechanical links in terms of flight controls between your oh. stick and the body, unless it gets yeah, unless yeah, it's designed to get severed. Still, they, get, they get severed. Uh, mm. There are there's a series of explosive charges mm. that uh, line the outside of the the pod, and that blow that cuts through everything. Wow. They're they're designed to cut through everything. So once that happens, yeah, it's it's gone, it's out, it's done, and so, you yeah. know, away you go. Yeah. Right. So there's no there's nothing uh fancy as such, it's just a shaped type charge that's in there that just destroys all those connections. How interesting. That's exactly what it is. Right. That is interesting. Right. Oh, that's Tuxford. I've been there. I didn't know they had an F-111. Right, I can't wait to go back and look at it now I know about it. Sorry, let's carry on. 
Right, excellent stuff. Um, ba, 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 ba. Was the Raven retired prematurely, in your opinion, because of cuts to the defence budget like the F-14, or was it just its time? Yeah, I, I think it was. Honestly, if we'd have been able to build more, or we'd have been able to upgrade F models without worrying about the cost, I think you would see this aircraft still in Air Force inventories. But it cost a lot of money. The government had decided that we had, you know, we, we had defeated we had defeated the Warsaw Pact, so we didn't need the aircraft anymore. And it was time for it to go. And I, I do think that the Air Force is still trying to find something to replace it. Now they may do something with the Global Hawk and make you know turn that into a into an electronic warfare drone i don't know they may do something with a, a c-130 like they had with the the old ec-130s but that's you know that still has a different mission from tactical jamming um they may find you know god only knows they might they might put something on an f-35 for it i mm. i don't know mm. but the 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 ef's mission I think was still so critical that it shouldn't have been retired as quickly as it was. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think it, sh it should have gone on and lasted because just because our, our threats change within a year doesn't mean that some of those old threats aren't going to come back. And you need to have people who are available in every service that, that, you know, that flies aircraft to do something like that, what the EF did and the air force decided to handle, you know, just put all the tactical jamming on the part of the Navy and the Marine Corps. And we've lost a lot of, we've lost a lot of capability because of that. One jump. Okay. Pretty much what I thought, thought you would say. Uh, a couple of quick fire questions. Why did you No, Sorry. As usual, can you tell us what is, in all of your lifetime, your favorite aircraft that you could take for a spin uh, in Dreamland, you know, so in bomber fighter, any age, just the one you'd really like to fly in, you know. One I would really like to fly. Well, that would have to be the F-16. Okay, what's the I, reason for I that? that? When I was a little kid, um, I got this huge, huge book on modern military aircraft of the mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. which at the time was 1979, mm -hmm. and... It had this huge color spread and layout of the the F sixteen, and I was totally in. You know, mm -hmm. I was totally engrossed by it. Um, matter of fact, the the spine on this air, on this book broke mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, exactly on the, the same where thing. It was. <laughs> and I just I just absolutely fell in love with the aircraft, and realized that yeah, you know this this is a short range fighter. It's not designed to do all kinds of stuff like mm -hmm. the F-15 or the F-14, but it's one of the most maneuverable aircraft we've got out there, mm -hmm. and it just looked it just looked absolutely badass. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the I mean that's one of the reasons why I've got the F-16 module. Um, the the F-5 is also very similar in in that regard to me because it's just this it's just this little low slung thing that just says I'm here to get inside all of your maneuvering and just eat your lunch. Mm -hmm. And there, there's not a thing you can do about it. And that's just, that's just what I loved about the plane. It was, it was a dog fighter in the time that everyone was still trying to get these, these mm -hmm. giant, you know, standoff aircraft. Mm -hmm. yep. So yeah, just, just loved it. I mean, yeah, same um, yeah. so I mean, was... my, my, my first, my first, my first interaction ever with an aircraft was when I was about a year old. My dad put me in the back in the back seat of an F four C that he was working on at the time, and I just loved it from there. My mm, jump, yep, same here. Just repeat my answer pretty much. I mean, there's there's actually some in mean, regard to that plane. I like a couple of sixties planes more, but contemporary fighters, that's mine. Why did you leave the Air Force, and would you go back to it? If I was, you know, it's, it's, they always say if I was 20 years younger mm. and 20 pounds lighter, oh yeah, I'd go back mm. in a heartbeat. I, I really would. Um, it was, it was, 
it was more it was more formative for me than anything I had done prior, and it was more formative to me as a person than even my my time when I went back to when I went back to college. And the entire reason I went I left the Air Force was to go back to college. And at the time, I still had no idea what I wanted to do when I got out. So yeah, I I I. I I kicked myself for, for getting out because I'd have almost 30 years and I'd almost be, I'd almost be ready for retirement right now. Had it not been, you know, had I stayed in. So I, I, I do kind of kick myself for that sometimes. Um, maybe I would have stayed in, finished up a degree in, uh, in aviation technology or maybe even got in for, you know, a, a, a math degree or something like that. I don't know. But, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of times I just sit there and go, yeah, yeah, should have stayed in a little longer, maybe a lot longer. I, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, if there, if there was a way I could go back for, for any part of the service, I would go back in a heartbeat. Mm, jump. Okay, we're running out of time, so I'm just picking some choice ones that I think are important. Um, pretty easy to answer, but were there any AWACS capabilities, or was it purely in the defensive jamming role? No AWACS. Yep, agreed. Uh, were there? This is an interesting one. Were there any structural changes between the Raven and the uh, what was it? Warhog? Warhog? No, not Warhog. Uh, sorry, Aardvark. Ar- Aardvark. <laughs> structural Just, changes between the uh, to account for its you know extra mass, three and a half tons of radar. Uh, not really. Saying. There was the only real physical difference besides the football and the canoe was the mm. uh, translating cows. And like I said in the mm, previous mm, one, mm. complete complete bear to work on. Well, I, I mean, my answer to th- I mean, not my answer, but, you know, my view on that is that, well, you're taking, you're adding three and a half tons of radar, but you've taken away three and a half tons of bombs. So it was already, it was already rated for that weight, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, but, and also, like I said, also in the original, in the in the first part, when they made these, a lot of them were starting to go through stress cracking. So mm-hmm. you weren't going. You weren't going to do 2.5 in the EF. No, of course not. You're going to do Mach 1.1 at worst. Yeah, and that was that was just to keep the airframe from you know to keep the airframe from not falling apart in the sky. Roger. Um, on Ravens that you worked on, what was the most critical problem, failure, whatever you want to say that you come across? Mine was usually uh, fuels. Mm. Just the indicator, just getting the fuel indication system to work properly. That was about it. Um, other than that, we, we did have some, we did have some errors here and there with, with flight controls, but that was mostly on the analog systems and that would be about it. Um, other than that, yeah, like I said, if, if it wasn't something running hydraulics, it was something running fuels and it was normal, you know, the, the one that was the kind, you know, that that took a long time to fix was usually the fuels. Watch up, amongst them. Um, this one here is an interesting one. Were the Block 30 and 40 F-16s capable to take on all the tasks of the Raven? Now, I don't know what Block 30 and 40 F-16 is. Is it some kind of EW variant that I'm not aware of? Or No, it's not. Uh, a Block 30 and Block 40 was the earliest, some of the earliest models of the F-16. And those replaced the F models when the F models were retired at mm-hmm. Cannon. Uh, oddly enough, some of the Block 30s that Cannon got were from my dad's old Air National Guard unit. As my dad's old Air National Guard unit went from Block 40s to Block 50s, the Block 40s and 30s were still in good shape. So they moved them from an Air National Guard unit to a regular Air Force unit. And they flew those for a long time until the mission changed again in the early 2000s at Cannon. So they had, I mean, it was it was so funny watching these aircraft come in and I saw the big SI on the side and I, I asked somebody from one of the other squadrons, I was just like, why, you know, it's like, why is my dad's old unit here? And they, they told me that, 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 uh, that all 12 of the aircraft that the, that were coming in from Springfield were all, going to uh, the 523rd as replacements for the F model. And I just, I just, it just blew my mind that 
you know, a regular Air Force unit would be getting old Air National Guard stuff that usually went in reverse. The Air National Guard would get the old Air Force stuff. So mm. I, just, I thought that was kind of funny. But um, no, there was no dedicated electronic warfare version right. of it. I think, Other you mean, than, I think you mean the F one eleven, not the F one eleven, but yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. But uh, no, the uh, as far as the as far as an electronic warfare version of the F sixteen, we did up a technical drawing of that once as a joke, just to mess with somebody mm -hmm. who was complaining about the F sixteen taking over everything on the base. <laughs> yeah, so that was about that. it. Roger, I'm um, two more questions. When I was looking back to the ALQ ninety nine. When I was looking at the AN ALQ99 pods for my CVN project, whatever CVN project is, I saw sp spotty stories about the pods being unreliable with poor built-in tests. Would you know have heard anything about this? He is actually talking about the ALQ99 jamming pods that go on the uh, Prowl, Prowl, the Prowl. EA6 growler. Right. And now also on the EA18 growler. Um, I don't know about those bit problems uh, other than when you have something that isn't hardwired into the mm. aircraft you're going to get you're going to get mm. you're going to introduce you know more areas for error mm. and when you're trying to run that through a weapons wiring system mm. the signals may get mixed and go into the wrong spot so i could see it failing bit tests for one so reason or another it's not so kind of, it's, it's not designed is dedicated into the airframe is it so you've got right. like you said mixed looms and stuff and you always have a certain amount of interference in mixed looms and right right i mean it's it's kind of like uh that that double ugly setup you had mm. for the f-18 okay yeah you can put it you can put a jamming you can put a tactical jamming pod on there but you're going to lose bomb space mm. or you can put a harm on there but you're going to lose you know jamming pod mm. space and it's all got to run through the same wires so mm. you, you so yeah i mean you can you know, you're going to introduce error like that. Okay, very good. Um, so saving in cost, but a reduction in, I don't know if reliability is the right word, word, but you know what I'm trying right. to say. And, but, but again, you have to look at the mission. That's mm. a carrier-based aircraft. Mm. Space is always at a premium on carrier aircraft. Mm. So you have to have aircraft that can do multiple things. It just can't do all of the things well mm. at the same time. Andrew, well, that's... Yeah, exactly. Someone's got to make that decision. Okay, last question, and I apologise for the questions I haven't answered. It's just uh, there's only so long we can I can do. What was the Ravens' involvement in? I know nothing about this, so this would be appreciated if you know anything. In the Yugoslavian conflict, and were they flying into the country's airspace or doing their duties from the edge of the borders? Do you know anything about that? And what year was it? Sorry for my naivety, but that is. Well, that, that was we were there in '95. Okay. And. While technically we probably, you know, officially speaking, we probably didn't go in. Mm -hmm. um, unofficially, I do remember seeing not bullet holes on the aircraft, mm -hmm. but bullet pits from where people tried firing, uh, tried firing, you know, 50 caliber guns and 20 millimeter mm -hmm. guns at us mm -hmm. and didn't have the range. Got close, but didn't have the range to penetrate. Uh, we, found, we found a couple of dents here and there on the aircraft that weren't there when we launched so mm -hmm. we were probably in country or at least close enough to uh close enough to the coastline to where uh you know where people could shoot but as far as anything else goes i would have to defer to the pilots mm -hmm. and the electronic warfare officers and they would have to tell you that stuff and some of them they may be like yeah that's still classified so i i really i really couldn't tell any further than that no job so it's just out of interest, the Yugoslavian war. So it's it's, it's kind of like a it says, it's like a group term. It says in Wikipedia for the Croatian war, the Bosnian war, the Kosovo war, and so on. That's how right. it's been described. Um, basically, what happened when we were in there, uh, the the Croatian war basically wound down. So they weren't they weren't invading into Bosnia Herzegovina anymore, but the mm -hmm. Serbians still. And that's where we were getting a lot of the ethnic cleansing that was going on in Serbian areas. You know, parts of Serbia as well as parts of Bosnia that they were trying to basically annex. So, yeah, it was uh, it it was it was a bloody and horrible. I mean, it was an absolutely horrible thing, and I'm very glad that I didn't have to see that up close. Mm. Yeah, right. That's gonna need some more research. I did. Oh no, <laughs> that's another story, but. Um... 
Okay, right. Um, JC, thank you very much. That's answered the, the main questions. Um, anything, and thank you for uh, giving all your time and doing this, and it's great that we got you while you're away from work and blah, blah, blah. For me, it's been one of the best ones so far because I've learned so much about a plane that I really care about, uh, which is great. Anything you want to add before we sign off? Oh, man. Um, well, as we always like to tell everybody, and I think this goes for the F-14 world as well as the B-1 world. And because I'm feeling nice, probably also the uh, the SU-19 and 24 worlds. Mm -hmm. um, we always had a little saying about our aircraft, and it was very simple. If your wings don't sweep, you ain't shit. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to use that when I fly my Tomcat. Brilliant. Well, it's been lovely to have you. I know it's taken months to organise, but it's just how these things work out. With you know, I've got so many people vying for spaces. Uh, thank you very much for that. And I and luckily, you're one of those guys that's going to stick around anyway. So I'll be seeing you whenever you've got the free time.